What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and I got to be honest with you guys. This is a video that has been a long time coming. I've been wanting to do a rookie mock draft where I sit down and talk through my top 24 picks of Superflex tight end premium for you guys using a mock draft. Today, we're going to use Jordan Reed's seven round mock draft that he did over at ESPN. I charted all the positional guys, all the quarterbacks, tight ends through the seventh round, and then I went in with the mindset of if this is how the draft played out, how would my first two rounds look like in a rookie draft? So I'm going to draft against myself. This has been, honestly, like I started writing it when the mock draft came out and then I got sidetracked making dynasty rankings over the weekend, got some dental work on Monday, came back to it today, finally finished. We have 12 pages of notes, 24 players to get through. Let's not waste any time. If you enjoy this at any point, make sure you down below, subscribe, leave a like, let's go. Now for this video, we're going to do a nice little sleeper thing here where I'm just going to have my face screen here. We'll go through, we'll make the picks. You guys can kind of see how things are shaking out. And the most important thing of the day that I'm going to try and keep up on the screen as long as I can throughout this video is how the picks actually happened in Jordan Reed's mocks in terms of what we care about quarterbacks running backs wide receivers tight ends also I even did a little the thing where you can uh I don't know I don't know what you call it but where you can like steal the color of things I even put the colors of the positions that match with sleeper so quarterbacks red running backs are green wide receivers blue tight ends are orange just soak all of that up I mean we're gonna get through a lot of these players I have uh the day two picks on the right hand side the day three picks on the left hand side uh the Screen grab on the left-hand side, we're going to have down for most of this video. But it's an interesting mock. You have ten, you have four quarterbacks going inside the top 10, Stroud to the Panthers, Young to the Texans, Richardson to the Colts. I kind of liked how cookie-cutter this was. Like, I don't need uh, anything too crazy. I know Lance Zierlein just came out with a mock where he had just, like, like the Patriots taking Anthony Richardson and some absolutely crazy stuff. That can happen, but I, I kind of like that this is a little bit more even-keeled. We have... Uh, JSN going to the Texans, which is fun. He gets to meet up with Bryce Young. Bijan Robinson to the Chargers is really fun. Quentin Johnson to the Ravens is okay. Jordan Addison to the Vikings. A Flowers to the Giants. You have some tight ends coming off the board to the Saints and the Raiders with Michael Mayer and Dalton Kincaid. Josh Downs to the Panthers. Jalen Hyatt to the Titans, both in round two. Darnell Washington to the Packers. They kind of get their uh, Mercedes Lewis fill in, I guess. You have uh, Jameer Gibbs going to the Dolphins, which is really fun. So, a lot of really, really interesting landing spots. I'm, I'm trying to see if anything else stands out. Hendon Hooker to the Lions is a fun spot. Uh, Marvin Mims in round two to the Eagles seems like a huge, huge boost for him. Uh, I also did like Tajay Spears to Washington is fun, and Devin A. Chain to the 49ers is fun as well. Uh, there are some notable names that went in day three. You had Kayshawn Boutte go in day three to the Panthers, it looks like. You have Zach Evans going day three to the Browns, which is fun. Uh, Eric Gray to the Saints. Just a lot to sort of just, it, it is, I, I mean, of course the draft is going to happen next week, but it is nice to just kind of see like just all of the players drafted on teams. Of course, this is going to mean absolutely nothing uh, once the draft actually happens, but it is cool kind, to kind of see it mapped out like this. So let's not, you know, mess around any longer. We're going to take this, we're, no, 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 we're going to take this one down. We'll leave this one up. I hope that this video comes out good in terms of formatting and stuff. It might, I don't know. Uh, let me know if things like get too crowded and stuff, um, and I'll deal with it later. But with the 101 here, your boy, yours truly, is on the clock here. And of course, it's B. John Robinson. This is, uh, of course, as well, we're men of class here, super flex, tight end, premium, rookie mock draft here. Again, I'm just going to be picking against myself. So at the 101, we're going to pick a player here, and we're going to go B. John Robinson. He goes at pick 21 overall to the Chargers. Jordan Reed also had a little blurb under a lot of these picks where he pretty much said that Austin Eckler gets his wish. He gets traded from the Chargers. And you have, like, this is maybe the nut landing spot in my eyes. Him on the Chargers? Like, this is a explosive offense. They've been good on, under Justin Herbert and, like, bad offense coordinators with, like, Anthony Lynn and Joe Lombardi. Now they get Kellen Moore, who's going to really inject some fun stuff into this offense. And you get Bijan coming in where they have a great offensive line with Rashawn Slater up, up front. I think Corey Lindsley's pretty good, their center. And the offense is going to be humming. This is one of the best-case scenarios for Bijan Robinson. He would be, like, I'm trying to think of if he goes to the Chargers, like, where do we think he goes in redraft? Like, underdog, your home league. Like, I would say 
top eight, if not top eight, then, you know, end of the first round, which is huge. You know, he's going to challenge for 20 points per game out the gate. He can do his pass catching profile is so strong that he can almost do what Eckler did last year where he had like 80 plus receptions. And then Bijan Robinson can also add 1000 plus yards on the ground with his, you know, 220 pound frame, really good, uh, missed tackle force type ability, whereas Eckler, despite having two 20-plus point-per-game seasons, has never rushed for a 1,000 or more yards. So this is like the most exciting spot possible for Bijan Robinson. And again, this is dynasty, right? We have Bijan Robinson forever, but I like to be a little bit more narrow-viewed with the running backs because it is, you know, strike while the iron's hot. While these running backs are young, producing points, holding value, that is the most important part of their life cycle in dynasty. And when we talk about redraft, like I said, like end of the first round, but I also think like after McCaffrey, you can make a case that Bijan would be RB2 in fantasy. Like the only other guys challenging him would be like Eckler, who wouldn't be on the Chargers anymore. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, who's not going to catch as many passes in a worse offense. You have, uh, I guess, Saquon Barkley, but he didn't catch that many passes last year. Like I'm trying to think through the guys you could maybe have ahead of Bijan, and it's not a lot. Yeah, I think it's literally just like those three or four guys that are kind of in that conversation. So he would be like redraft RB2 on the Chargers. That's enough, enough of gushing over Bijan Robinson. I'm sure you've heard enough about Bijan Robinson through this whole cycle, which brings us to the 102. And I can't stress enough when we get to draft season. I've made a video each of the last two years. I don't think I'll make another one because I don't want to just keep making the same video over and over again. But I'm very much of the belief draft capital over landing spot. Landing spot's cool. It's a tiebreaker, but like draft capital really, really matters where you get drafted, right? Of course, quarterbacks, we would like them to go to a really cozy landing spot. Like I guess like Trey Lance on the 49ers, but there's a lot of dysfunction in the NFL. Joe Burrow went to the Bengals in a time where they were like one of the worst teams, franchises around. Same thing with Trevor Lawrence on the Jaguars. I'm trying to think through the other one, Kyler Murray on the on the Cardinals. He's pretty much like saved uh, Cliff Kingsbury's job his first like three years. You have Deshaun Watson with Bill O'Brien. So you have a lot of these guys where in my eyes, if you got it at quarterback, you got it at quarterback. And it's really not even a terrible spot. It's not as nice as these other places. Uh, but fourth overall for Anthony Richardson is legit, legit big boy draft capital. Fourth overall. Like this is... Now we have it locked in, A. Rich, fourth overall. And at that spot, that is big boy draft capital. That is top five draft capital. That is going higher than Josh Allen in the class that he went in. Uh, and that was without, I mean, Baker went first and Sam Darnold went third. I guess it's a, a similar uh, situation here. But give me Anthony Richardson. All of these guys with this draft capital, Richardson, CJ Stroud, Bryce Young, they all grade out as elite in the RS grades, which gives them like a 90% plus chance of hitting a top 12 quarterback season. They're all very, very strong prospects. For me, give me the one with the crazy uh, rushing upside, the 4-4 speed. He was made in a lab to score fantasy points. Like He can get you to 20 plus points per game, and I'm not sure he even has to pass for over 20 passing touchdowns. That's how explosive he is on the ground. And I think that there's a lot of room to grow for him in the passing game as well. Like I keep hearing he's raw, and I guess he's raw, I like the word inexperience more because we have a guy like Will Levis who is raw, who is like 23, 24, has like four or five seasons in college and is still bad. He took minus 23.4 EPA on sacks in his final year. Anthony Richardson just minus 7.1. EPA is expected points added, so it's just how much uh, of a negative impact are you causing your team from sacks? And we see a lot of times with rushing quarterbacks, they come out here and they get sacked in a terrible fashion. Like that was Justin Fields' biggest issue last year. Something that Russell Wilson has struggled with as well. These mobile quarterbacks, they extend plays behind uh, behind the line of scrimmage and they get sacked and they give you massive negative plays. Anthony Richardson doesn't do that. So he has an under 60% completion percentage for sure. And that is concerning, but he only has one year as a starter at the college level and it was in the SEC and he was explosive. So like I said, he is raw, but I think that he's inexperienced more than he's raw. Like I think there's a lot of room to grow here. I think you can fix his mechanics, mechanics and fix the completion percentage issues, but at least he's not making the boneheaded plays of like scrambling behind the line of scrimmage and just taking awful, awful negative sacks. Like he had he had less expect, expected points added lost on sacks than Bryce Young did this year, which is really crazy considering the fact that Richardson's more inexperienced. He's more, I guess, like wild in his decision making and he runs the ball more and he still was able to not take very negative plays from sack. So I'm very excited about him. And he comes into a spot on the Colts where it doesn't sound great, 
But you get Steichen at head coach, who was the offensive coordinator last year for the Eagles, who ran a system with Jalen Hurts. So you bring him over, and you let Anthony Richardson thrive in a similar Jalen Hurts-type offense. You have an extremely dynamic rushing attack with Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor. You have a offensive line with a lot of upside to bounce back, right? They were one of the best units for the last, like, three years. Last year had a down year. I know the, the tackle they drafted, Raymond, uh, was really bad early on, but he kind of developed towards the end. You have Quentin Nelson, of course, who can just turn it up and be an all-pro guard at any point in time. So there's a lot to like here. You have Michael Pittman as, like, a true number one option. Maybe they add uh, another pass-catching option in the draft or something. So I don't know. Uh, I think Gardner Minshew starts the first few weeks in this scenario, but I imagine he gets the keys to the offense by like week six, week seven. So this is really all I could ask for in terms of a landing spot, in terms of situation for Anthony Richardson. Now, our next pick, our 103, is going to be Bryce Young. I cannot stress enough, all three of these quarterbacks, like anybody out there that has my dynasty rankings, by the way, those are live on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. It's probably going to be covered by this graphic, but patreon.com slash Ron Stewart has my dynasty rankings, my rookie rankings, all of that. If you go to... Uh, the top 250 dynasty ranking Superflex tight end premium, you'll see from like 208 to 210 is literally these three quarterbacks in a row. They will all be in a row. I am literally splitting hairs here and essentially ordering them by rushing upside. And I like Young here. He goes second overall to the Texans. He gets to work with somebody that I had to look at after I went on ship chasing. I kind of embarrassed myself. And I was like, uh, the Texans, they still got Lovey Smith over there. Look, I haven't done my redraft research. I'm not completely caught up in all the coaching changes. Now I am, uh, or I wasn't back then. Now I am. And you have Bryce Young getting... So, of course, D'Amico Ryan's is the new head coach with the Texans. But they have an offensive coordinator uh, named Bobby Slowick. He actually worked for PFF for a little bit. And then he served as offensive coordinator slash, like, passing game coordinator. Like, one of those, like, quality control type guys under uh, Kyle Shanahan on the 49ers. So, he's one of those guys in that... Uh, LaFleur, McVay, Shanahan type tree, which is exciting because they drop QB friendly offenses for their young quarterbacks. And there's a lot of upside there. You'd hope that this guy coming from there, most of the time it works out, right? McVay has looked good. LaFleur has looked good. I mean, I even liked LaFleur with the Jets. Uh, I mean, of course he didn't develop Zach Wilson, but some guys are just not salvageable. Now also in this mock, something to note is or like when we talk, when we talk about this mock and stuff is that Players went to the same team, right? So Bryce Young actually gets JSN to throw to, which is really exciting. So he has some nice weapons on the tech, or not, maybe not nice weapons, but I mean, you have JSN, you'd have uh, Dalton Schultz, Laramie Tunsil up front. Uh, I think Robert Wood signed with the Texans. You got Damian Pierce in the backfield. So it's like, it's a serviceable offense. And you have a, a I do like that all these young quarterbacks and the spots they're going to are like, new head coaches, new offensive coordinators, so you're, you know, developing everything. Like, I think one of the biggest issues with uh, Sam Darnold on my Jets, I, I know I keep bringing you back to the Jets, but it's really bad. I mean, you saw the same thing with Baker. The discontinuity, right, where, like, somebody drafts a quarterback and it's not their quarterback. Like, I think, I don't think Adam Gase drafted Sam Darnold. I want to say Todd Bowles did. So Adam Gase came in with like a new quarterback and it was just like a quarterback he didn't even draft. The quarterback has to learn another playbook. It's like this whole mess. So it's nice to have new regime coming in year one. They get their pick out of quarterback. And that's what we're seeing with the Texans. That's what we're seeing uh, with the Panthers, with the Colts here. All of these teams have new uh, coaching schemes. And we talk about uh, Bryce Young's rushing upside. This is why I think it's kind of like sneaky good is because PFF charts rushing yards for quarterbacks without taking out sacks which is really annoying that like college football reference does that or whatever for fantasy we don't care about sacks because sacks don't count against us in fantasy like sacks of course are bad plays or negative plays but i already look at that stuff with the epa uh lost on sack stuff and when we look at rushing points per game that each of these quarterbacks had in their final year i cannot stress enough this isn't what i expect them to do in the league i'm not expecting anthony richardson to lead the league in rushing points per game on the ground it's just to get a gauge like i would probably knock like maybe like one to two points off of each of these and I think it's very much ideal or very much possible for Bryce Young. I said this on ship chasing, but I don't think he's going to be. Obviously, he's not going to be in the Lamar Jackson and above area. I think Anthony Richardson can be in the Lamar Jackson and above area or the Josh Allen and, and above area is what I would call it. But I think it's very easy or not easy, but it's very possible for him to be in this Deshaun Watson, Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Kenny Pickett, Trevor Lawrence area of like 2.77 to like 3.75 points per game on the ground. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a really, really nice boost when 
it's a passing league and everybody has good passing numbers, right? That is what's giving you wins above replacement, fantasy points above replacement over your Kirk Cousins, Daniel Jones, Russell Wilson's, Derek Carr's that are just like very easy QB2s. Bryce Young, I think, can get a little bit of that rushing floor to, to stack on top of his upside. He's already a very natural passer, a very good passer. So he is really exciting, Bryce Young. Now, again, all of these guys are nice. If you want to have Stroud at your QB2 uh, or your 102, literally wouldn't fault you at all for it. That's where we're going to put Stroud. I'll have Stroud as my 104 here. I also want to say I have these three quarterbacks back to back to back. I've gotten some questions like, would you take JSN over one of the quarterbacks? Probably not, especially in this mock. We're talking three quarterbacks with top five draft capital in the NFL. You go into a startup, it's essentially quarterbacks plus Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson in the first round. Quarterbacks with top five draft capital all have a shot to rise in value to a first round startup pick. I want a lottery ticket on that outcome because if a quarterback can rise to like a top six startup pick, the amount of value you've accrued, even using like a 102 on that player is massive. Like the amount that you have to move to get a Justin Herbert or a Trevor Lawrence or a Joe Burrow or a Jalen Hurts is absolutely massive. And no one, no other position gets you into that spot besides quarterback. So I'm just going to have those three quarterbacks at the top. It's too much of a high leverage position to take a wide receiver. Now this could be egg on my face. JSN becomes Jamar Chase and he is then grouped in with your Jamar Chase Jefferson in the first round of startups. And that's very much possible, but I think it's a, a thinner bet than the quarterbacks. I don't think the quarterbacks have to do as much. Like you, you would need JSN to have a Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, like rookie year. I think that Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson could get him to the first round of startups. Like you probably just being like a back end QB one, you know, or like a a, a a mid range QB two, or somebody in like six starts gets like you know eighteen plus points per game. So it, it it's not as as thin or as much of an upside swing. Now when we talk about CJ Stroud. He goes first overall to the Panthers, which is pretty much where uh, I wouldn't say he's a lock to go at this point, but he's like minus three hundred on betting markets. So essentially there, and I'm open to the idea that I'm overthinking the rushing upside thing. Like you see CJ Stroud at the bottom there like he's by Jimmy Garoppolo he's by you know Dak Prescott who contrary to popular belief Dak Prescott isn't mobile anymore ever since that ankle injury uh that he had he doesn't run as much anymore now maybe that comes back but CJ Stroud is very much towards your statues and that's not good now maybe he gets to the NFL and he runs more I know Justin Fields was somebody who came to the NFL and ran more than he did in college I don't think Stroud is the same athlete or has the same MO of wanting to run the ball but I am open to the idea that I'm overthinking this and Stroud is going to come on to the scene in the NFL from day one, being elite passer, like we saw with Justin Herbert, like we saw with Joe Burrow, immediately elevate his offense and just be that guy. He is the most accurate quarterback in this class. He was at 50.8% completion percentage on throws of 20 plus yards, which is just insane. Uh, Bryce Young was at 44%. Richardson was at 41%. Again, completely open to the idea that he is just that dude as a passer. The issue for me with Stroud is that the rushing upside isn't there. To get into like difference making quarterback production, you're going to need. 20 plus passing touchdowns in year one and then challenge for 30 plus the rest of the way to get into that uh statue quarterback that gets valued as like a first round startup pick but maybe he adds like 2.5 rushing points per game on the ground and doesn't need that so it is really tough to project uh again i could be overthinking it he does get josh downs in this mock which is nice he gets frank reich and he gets uh josh mcdown or josh mccown to sort of develop him he gets a nice ecosystem in place it's not bad now, our next guy at the 105 is JSN. We'll take JSN here. He goes 12th overall to the Houston Texans in this mock. And he, in this draft, is the first wide receiver off the board in real life. He's my wide receiver one in Dynasty. And he would likely lead the Texans in targets out the gate. I don't think that Dalton Schultz will have more than him. I don't think Robert Woods would have more than him. So that's pretty nice. Now, he's going to have a rookie quarterback in Bryce Young, which isn't super ideal uh, out the gate, but I think long-term that's just fine, right? Like you can kind of draw the similarity of, uh, I guess the Bengals drafting Joe Burrow and T Higgins in the same class kind of feels that same way. So you're betting in a way that Bryce Young is going to be good or maybe not betting on Bryce Young, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like a rising tide lifts all ships. If JSN's balling out, Bryce Young's going to be balling out. If Bryce Young's balling out, JSN's going to be balling out. So 
rookie quarterback is a little bit of a concern, but again, we're playing the long game in Dynasty. I'm just betting on talent when it comes to this stuff. And we talked earlier about the Texans. They're not as terrible of a spot as people would think. Now, JSN, super clean profile, of course. Uh, zero in year one, but you can't really hold that against him playing behind what? Garrett Wilson, Olave, Jamison Williams. I'm probably even missing guys from like that previous class before uh, Garrett Wilson, Olave. I'm trying to think who else was really out there. Uh, but after that, he comes out, dominates next to Garrett Wilson and next to Chris Olave, which is really, really impressive. Uh, zero in year three, but he like dealt with injuries and stuff. I've said this before, but if he just sat out like Jamar Chase did before his third year, I think that it wouldn't be as much of a question mark. He is a really, really solid wide receiver prospect. He's a high-end elite for me. Uh, I'm treating him as almost a legendary at this point just because I think that he's that good. Uh, it's just hard to communicate how good his profile is into numbers because of like the the weird last year and the uh, not getting on the field until year two. But really, really strong profile. He's also a sneaky athlete as well. I absolutely love the fact that he put up the 12th best wide receiver three cone since 2007 and the fourth best 20 yard shuttle since 2007 with a 657 and a 393. It's hard to really wrestle what those numbers even mean in terms of like shuttle and three cone time. But for a guy who's played out of the slot and operates, you know, before the first down marker, like an Amon Ross St. Brown, like a Cooper Cup, we want a guy who can, you know, has all the wiggle in the world, is just like super agile, super quick, making moves in a phone booth. We don't need him to run a 4-2, right? He ran like a 4-5 something, which like isn't great, but who cares? Like as a slot guy, we don't need long speed. He's not going to be running a ton of go routes or or deep, uh, you know, crossers or anything out of the slot. He's going to be a technician doing his thing, getting open. Uh, and he's actually pretty explosive after the catch. So he's really exciting. Uh, he should be, you know, a target hog type profile, elite change of direction athlete, super, super clean prospect. I'll take him at 105 and not have a single issue with it. Now, here is where... I see a little bit of a tear break and it's so close between these three. I, I have Will Levis, Jameer Gibbs, Quentin Johnston, all in this little mini tier. And I think you could make the case for any of them at 106. And it's a really, really tough decision. But I'm going to go with Will Levis. And when you look at Will Levis versus the other two, it's just a matter of like, making an impact and increasing in dynasty value. We look at Quentin Johnston. I love Quentin Johnston. But unless if you have a Drake London, Olave, Garrett Wilson type rookie year, you're not going to like just ascend, right? You're going to be in like the back end teens. Like that's where Devonta Smith was last year heading into year three. He was like a, uh, or no, heading into year two last year, Devonta Smith. He was like wide receiver 18 in dynasty. Like that's probably where he'd be right where Christian Watson is now. And that's fine. But that's like a massive ROI on your 106, right? Uh, you could make the case with Jameer Gibbs. I think Jameer Gibbs has a ton of upside as a young running back, right? Around 14 points per game as a rookie could get him into like the Kenneth Walker area where Kenneth Walker's a 2-3 turn pick. DeAndre Swift was like a 2-3 turn pick uh, after his first year. Like actually he was more like a mid to early second after his first year. A lot of these guys get propped up without doing much in their rookie year. So it's easy to see Gibbs return value, but I got to go Will Levis. He's taken seventh overall. Again, the first round of startups is all quarterbacks. We've seen quarterbacks. We've seen Josh Allen. We've seen Justin Herbert. We've seen a lot of these guys where like the community is like very out on these quarterbacks, and then they end up being fine. So 106 is pretty steep, but... I'm fine betting on him at this point. I think you have to. He goes seventh overall to the Raiders. Like, you can only push him down so far. You know, you can only push him down so far. Like, it's a pretty decent spot. He gets Devontae Adams to throw to. Uh, he gets to sort of, like, develop behind Jimmy Garoppolo. Josh Jacobs to kind of take the pressure off of him in the run game. Kobe Myers, Hunter Renfro, who are guys who can kind of get open in the short to intermediate areas. It's not like a dream spot, but... It's not terrible. And seventh overall, considering what we've been hearing about how he could slip or whatever, he goes late first, and I'm probably putting him like 109-ish. But, I mean, seventh overall to the Raiders, man, I got to put him here. Again, this is a tier. If you want to have these guys flip-flopped around, I guarantee by the time the draft happens, I'll have these guys flip-flopped around. But Will Levis has a lot of upside as a rusher. He has a big arm. He has the profile of an absolute upside swing, which is what we're looking for in quarterbacks. I want guys that can challenge four first-round startup pick value 
Will Levis has that profile. Now, he's a statue in the RS grades, but I think that doesn't really uh, describe his rushing upside super well. If we look at the PFF stuff, his final year was really bad. Just 119 rushing yards and two touchdowns. That's less than what Bryce Young had. But he had, like, injuries and stuff. Like, he had a bunch of different injuries going on. If you go to the year before that, he had 516 rushing yards and nine touchdowns, which is much better than Bryce Young, like almost challenging Anthony Richardson. He's a big body too, so he can be that goal line type uh, quarterback. So it's all really interesting. I think he probably settles somewhere between that like 119 and two and 516 and nine and probably can challenge for that like three plus point per game area on the ground that we see Trevor Lawrence, we see uh, Joe Burrow at. I think Will Levis can get there and maybe even challenge for more than that. So that's why I I'm kind of excited for him. Again, he takes awful sacks. He's like 24. There's a ton not to like here, but I think you're being really arrogant. I think you're being really arrogant if you take a, a second round running back over him or if you take a wide receiver prospect that has some red flags. I could get talked out of this. I could get talked into putting him at 108. I really could. Again, these guys are razor, razor close for me. <sighs> But this is how this is how I'll have it. I, I will say though, if Jameer Gibbs goes first round, uh, Jameer Gibbs first round draft capital, Jameer Gibbs clears Will Levis. Now here's the thing: if he doesn't go round one, Jameer Gibbs going to the Dolphins is literally the next best case. Now it's like Ron, Jameer Gibbs going first round doesn't make him like magically a better player. No, not really, but it gives him a ton of opportunity. There's a massive, massive increase in hit rate, increase in like expected points per game through your first three years for first round running backs especially in this day and age in the nfl where first round running backs are very rare so if a team goes out there and decides hey we're going to invest a first round pick in jameer gibbs sign me all the way up that takes him out of the like right now he's a little bit iffy where he's in the i'm trying to think of sort of these comps here but he's in like the javid best like steve slayton uh like you can put LaShawn mccoy in there but i think that that's a little bit uh not unjust but a little bit dishonest but if he goes first round, then you can start making his comps like C.J. Spiller is one who, by the way, C.J. Spiller would have been an absolute stud in the modern NFL. I'm trying to think of these other guys too, like Chris Johnson, you can say too. Chris Johnson was taken in the first round. So you can kind of, uh, uh, the the size concerns and stuff, a team invests first round draft capital and all of the concerns of like, maybe he won't get used on the goal line. Maybe he won't have a featured uh, role on an offense as like a true He's never going to be a true bell cow, but, you know, a true difference maker, 15 plus touches per game type guy. And I'm not saying that, that, that he's a lock for those things if he goes first round, but there's a much better probability that those things happen if he goes first round. So he goes second round tier, but he goes to the Dolphins, which is really, really nice. Like this is, if he doesn't go first round, this is the next best thing. We have Mike McDaniel here. This is the landing spot of dreams. They are seventh in pass rate over expectation. They're going to run an offense that passes the ball. And I'm sure Tua is going to have no problem as kind of a statuish type quarterback checking it down to Jameer Gibbs when Waddle or Tyreek Hill aren't open. And Mike McDaniel runs a sharp offense that utilizes their tools. And I do truly believe that if Mike McDaniel uses a second round pick on a running back, he will use them. I think that we could see uh, an Aaron Jones, Austin Eckler type role here where Gibbs won't rush for a thousand plus yards, but he will catch passes, be explosive, be used in creative ways and motion and maybe even split out wide. There's a lot here to like if he sort of gets matched up with McDaniel here. I also want to say with the McDaniel thing, he doesn't have a ton of competition right now. It's just Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert on the Dolphins. Then you also get the twist of he signed, he went out on the free agent market and signed Chase Edmonds last year. This is a role in the offense I think that he might want. I wonder as well if he was one of the guys that wanted Jarek McKinnon on the 49ers, right? This like small, explosive pass catching back. It seems like it's something that he wants, right? Last year he didn't get it because Chase Edmonds just like fell apart or whatever, but it seems like this is an archetype that Mike McDaniel likes. So if he'd use a second round pick on him, I have full trust in his, you know, ability to scheme Jameer Gibbs and make him a future part of the offense, which is really exciting. And the entire reason why we're, we're chasing the ceiling on Jameer Gibbs is the pass catching upside. His receiving profile, bar none, goes toe to toe with Christian McCaffrey. It is them two. In terms of like first round running backs with receiving profiles, it is them two. And then it is the rest of the field. He is up there. He smokes McCaffrey in year one. He goes toe to toe with him in year two, falls a little bit back down to earth in year three, but he played on Alabama and was featured more in the rushing game. So the receiving upside is there. He could challenge for like 75 plus receptions in year one. Really, 
really exciting. I think you could have a DeAndre Swift type year one where he puts up like 14, 15 points per game. He's a second round starter pick heading into year two. There is a lot to like with the receiving upside, with the profile, the explosiveness, the 4 3 40. It's all beautiful. Now, after that, oh my God, we're 30 minutes in and I'm only at the 106, boys. <laughs> oh my God. All right. We'll see. This might be a marathon of a video. I, 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 I'm, I'm going until we hit 24 picks. So, I, I mean, you guys can skip, skip around. I'll put timestamps in here. This is me just going to be, you know, emptying my brain on all of these prospects. Now, we have Quentin Johnson going to the uh, – and I didn't even actually make this Jameer Gibbs pick. I hope – I hope that that's not that doesn't get confusing. Uh, but all right, so we'll put Quentin Johnson here. I'll take him at the 108. He goes to the Ravens, 20 uh, second, uh, 22nd overall, and that's kind of exciting. Like Todd Monken coming to the uh, Ravens instead of having Greg Roman there. Todd Monken is a guy who is a really fun off the coordinator. Like this is kind of a good. This would be a good passing attack if if Lamar Jackson stays. I kind of expect Lamar Jackson to stay at this point, but of course we don't have 100 percent certainty on that. But Quentin Johnson gets first round draft capital, and this is a pretty sweet spot here. Uh, if we look, this is a quote from Harbaugh. He said, it's 100% likely that it will be different in terms of the offense. It will be changing. This will be a bigger change because we've got a new offensive coordinator. We've got new coaches in place. I think we're going to be exciting. We're going to be fun. We're going to still run the ball, but we're going to throw the ball. We're going to be up-tempo probably even more than we've been, maybe a little more no huddle. We're going to be living in a lot of different worlds with our offense, and that's what I'm looking forward to. Then we have this highlighted portion here. However, this was probably a third, the third time where Harbaugh mentioned picking up the pace on offense. It was also a popular topic during Harbaugh's often coordinator interviews after Greg Roman's departure. So this is an exciting spot. They're going to pass the ball more. They're going to run more up-tempo, more no huddle. Todd Mockin is somebody that has had uh, some decent success around the league. I think he was with the Browns for a little bit, then the Buccaneers when they had like Jameis Winston and Ryan Fitzpatrick like combined to like lead the league in passing yards in terms of like team passing yards. So he's somebody that can draw it up. Uh, run a, you know, a modern offense. And with Quentin Johnston, I know the raw stats aren't great, right? Like, I think he just has, like, his best years, like, a 1,000 yards and six touchdowns. But he looks just fine in my model as a wide, as an elite wide receiver prospect. He, uh, if he gets an elite RAS score, which we still don't have on him because, like, the pro day was weird. We, we might never get one, but if we do, uh, all he needs is an 8.8 .8 or better, and he'll be a legendary wide receiver prospect, would still have him behind JSN. Still sort of have to acknowledge the floor with Quentin Johnson. I 100% acknowledge it's a very wide range of outcomes. He is no sure thing. The catch point stuff is an issue. The drops are an issue. I read his reception perception uh, Matt Harmon made the other day. It was really uh, good and informative. And he talked about his contested catch ability is not good. Like he, uh, for a big wide receiver, doesn't play big, which is also a concern. He's somebody where he's like jumping up and catching things with his body for no reason. It's not good. He could work on it. He has a ton of upside uh, otherwise where – he is really exciting. He has like a crazy yard of the catch ability despite having an A dot like way downfield. Uh, Matt Harmon had a little blurb too in that article. I wish I had it that I could show you guys, but he literally said something on the lines of like, in terms of yards of the catch and making guys miss, Quentin Johnston is in the same boat as Kadarius Tony, Garrett Wilson, Rondale Moore as like really explosive and, you know, exciting after the catch, which all of those guys, I mean, Garrett Wilson's bigger than Ron Delmore and Kadarius Tony, but he's also like 183 pounds. You get that profile on a 6'3", 208 guy, like that is really, really exciting. He's a 21-year-old, early declare, good athlete, advanced stats producer, produced all three years, first round pick in this mock. Uh, he also in that reception perception article, 85th percentile success rate versus man. So he's getting open on the perimeter, on the outside. He's a, he's a decent separator. He can run routes. Obviously, he's not as refined as like JSN and Jordan Addison and everything, but there's promise there. It's really just a red flag of the hands, of the contested catch stuff. And that's kind of the risk you have to take here because I think the upside is really, really massive for Quentin Johnston. Now, at our 109 here, we are going to take Jordan Addison. Jordan Addison goes 23rd overall to the Vikings. This is where I'd have the next tier break as well. I think you can take any of your favorite wide receivers here. They're all in a massive, massive tier. My model has Jordan Addison as a gold, just like the rest of the wide receivers in this area, but I think that's almost too harsh. I think it's dinging him. He doesn't have a great land zero line grade. I think it's dinging him a little bit for the RAS stuff as well, but he's a three-year producer, a smooth route runner. Sadly, I don't think that he actually performed well in reception perception. So maybe he's not as good as a route runner as a lot of the film guys have told me, but I'm willing to bet on him 
to be a decent separator in the NFL, to be kind of a technician. I don't think that he'll ever be a wide receiver one or challenge for 20 points per game. But that's kind of the theme with all of these quarterbacks after the top, or all these wide receivers after JSN, after Quentin Johnston. I don't think anybody has that upside. So I'm fine to just kind of bet on a guy who is a good route runner, is a nice like Robin to what would be Justin Jefferson's Batman. And this just kind of sums it up here. This is a good tweet from uh, from Hayden Winks, and it just shows, you know, his yards per hour run versus man coverage, 3, 3.9, 4.4. Anything over, like, 3 is elite. So he's winning against man coverage. He's doing great in that department. Uh, he produced all three years with, like, different quarterbacks at Pitt, at USC, early declare, 21 years old. It's really easy to like him, and as well, he gets a really great landing spot with the Vikings where he comes into a spot. Kevin O'Connell kind of pushed the passing game envelope last year. Uh, and... Oh, my goodness. I hope you guys said bless you. I really do. Um, all right, so you have KJ Osborne there. That's going to be... I, I mean, KJ Osborne, of course, is no slouch, but it's, like, not the most crowded wide receiver room of all time, right? Adam Thielen's gone after KJ Osborne. It's, like, Jalen Naylor. So, at the very least, he's out there in three wide receiver sets. If not, then he may be out, be out there in two wide receiver spots. You have O'Connell, who's a sharp head coach, uh, passing game guy, Kirk Cousins, very capable quarterback. So I think he can kind of be, uh, if he gets drafted here, like a diet version. Like I'm talking like mini, mini, mini version of what Devonta Smith was next to AJ Brown. A lot gets open underneath when you have Justin Jefferson over the top, just like commanding brackets and commanding double teams and a lot of the attention of defenses. I think Jordan Addison could carve out a nice little role. I think I don't expect him to put up 1,400 uh, receiving yards and over 100 receptions in year two, but like kind of Juju next to A.J. Brown also kind of feels similar term, from a role perspective. I know they're not similar players, but from a role perspective. Uh, after that, we have the 110 here, and we'll take Josh Downs, who goes 39th overall in the second round to the Panthers. And this is, again, like just take whatever wide receiver you like here. Uh, we'll talk about some of the running backs in a little bit. Uh, I'd be open to having Charbonnet in here, but he didn't have a great landing spot or great draft capital for that. Uh, so I'll just take some wide receivers that I think have strong profiles. Now, Josh Downs, carbon copy of Elijah Moore, 5'9", 171 pounds, plays bigger than his size, elite wide receiver prospect, despite being a second round uh, undersized wide receiver. He is someone now, again, he's an elite wide receiver prospect. The reason I don't have him ahead of Addison, he's a he's an elite wide receiver prospect in the fact that he is a very good bet to hit a top 24 season, which is what we're solving for with the RS grades. But I don't think he's a great bet to, to you know, have like a top 12 finish or anything. I think that he is a nice number two option. Maybe he develops more than that. I like to see that. Now, something that is exciting about him is that he plays bigger than his frame. And this is something that uh, Matt Harmon touched on in Recession Perception. He says, easily my favorite part of Josh Downs' profile is that the 5'9", 171 receiver is the best contested catch player in the class. Downs saw a contested target on 18% of his looks and checked in with an excellent and class, class best 93.8% contested catch rate hilarious so he's going out there making plays mossing guys despite being five nine hundred seventy one pounds he has elite production across the board he has an elite lands deer line grade lands deer line has been as his wide receiver two in this class early declare undersized but again he should be a nice like number two option or like a 1b type option in the nfl which is nice and he goes to the panthers who are gonna have no car target competition like i guess you could say like adam thielen and hayden hurst but that's really not much like lavisca chenault it's really not much there he'd come in right away be the guy in the slot for cj stroud and you know that would be fine similar to sort of jsn where like it wouldn't be great out the gate with a rookie quarterback but i also think that it's not the end of the world because these quarterbacks especially bryce young and cj stroud are good throwers of the football now after that our 111 we have Zay Flowers. Now, this is a little bit of a surprise to people because in a vacuum, I've had Flowers behind Jalen Hyatt. Uh, I think as of recently, I'm going to have Zay Flowers ahead of Jalen Hyatt. Zay Flowers is a really, really interesting profile. It, he is not is never going to look good numbers-wise because when we talk about like receiving yards per team pass attempt and all of that, there is some... There's some weight towards your quarterback. And his quarterback play at Boston College was awful. I think, like, even... Uh, I keep referencing reception perception. Go buy reception perception. It's it's amazing. Like talk through all the rookie wide receivers, and I don't want to, I don't want to reveal all of Matt's secrets. So I think that what he does is amazing, and I don't want to take away from any of his sales or anything. Uh, but he talked through Zay Flowers. Like he said something on the, among the lines of like Zay Flowers. Like I wouldn't call it concentration issues, but like 
um, frustration with the quarterback. Like, kind of Elijah Moore last year with Zach Wilson was, like, clear, like, he wasn't given 100% on everything, on every single play, because, you know, he could get open at the top of the route, have an amazing rep, and then the ball gets thrown to somebody else, or the ball gets thrown over his head, or the quarterback just stands in the pocket like a statue and gets sacked. So, it's tough to have a guy put 100% the best tape every single time on the field with Zay Flowers, but he goes to the Giants here at 25th overall, which is really, really exciting. And Zay Flowers, when it comes to prospects, again, he's never going to look good in the numbers, right? He's a four-year guy, non-early declare. Uh, I think like Devonta Smith might be, might be the only elite or better prospect uh, with four as a non-early declare. Actually, I think it's like Devonta Smith. It's like Demarius Thomas, maybe. You have to be very exceptional. Uh, Zay Flowers isn't that, which is fine. Uh, because that was Chris Olave last year, and he, you know, blew up in my face. And I, it, it wouldn't shock me at all if Zay Flowers was that. Like he, like I said, he reminds me a lot of Jalen Waddle. Where of course Jalen Waddle was like an early declare, but he had uh, not a great numbers profile, but a guy that the film community gushed over. I know some guys even had him as like wide receiver one in that class, just from what Jalen Waddle put on film. You see the same thing with Zay Flowers. I know like Steve Smith, who by the way works with Underdog, absolutely loves Zay Flowers. Uh, all the film guys love him. Lance Dillon has him wide receiver three over Quentin Johnston, over uh, JSN, over all of your favorite wide receivers. I can't communicate what makes him so good with the numbers, but it is exciting that he isn't a slot guy. Like Josh Downs has played uh, most of his reps in the slot. Like a lot of these tiny guys have played exclusively in the slot. Zay Flowers, he's he's small at 5'9", but he's not the same small as Jordan Addison, who's like, I think like 5'11", 170 pounds. Zay Flowers is 5'9", 182. So he's compact, which is nice. And he has a career 33.9% slot percentage. So he is someone that can play on the outside, on the inside. He can win downfield. He can win in the short areas. He's good after the catch. So he's good everywhere. The film guys love him. And he's one of those guys where I'm sort of willing to take a pass on Zay Flowers where I'm sure the model doesn't love him, but I sort of understand the appeal. I understand the appeal. I really do. And it would be fun to see him in this offense with Brian Dable on the Giants, 25th overall in the first round, and probably kind of use him the way that Brian Dable probably dreamed of using Kadarius Toney, but Kadarius Toney just like kept pulling his hamstring and like being a knucklehead at times or whatever. I think Zay Flowers would be like, again, like I think it would be exactly what Dable's looking for. Uh, of course, you'd have like Darren Waller for target competition, you'd have Saquon Barkley, but He'd be a nice number three option in this offense. I think I, I trust Dable enough to run a, a good offense that would future Zay Flowers and be good. So he's exciting there. I think as a, a late first round pick, I'm completely fine with Zay Flowers. Now, our last of like this huge tier of wide receivers here, we'll go Jalen Hyatt. And Jalen Hyatt's been somebody that I've sort of been souring on a little bit recently. The model really liked him out the gate. I think that he, uh, after his pro day, his RES sort of came down. He was an elite. I want to say he's probably like more like a gold now. Uh, and he's really tough to wrestle with. He's a very weird profile. He goes second round, 41st overall to the Titans here, which is not a fun landing spot at all. You have Todd Downing gone at this point. They bring in Tim Kelly, uh, who is like, it's sort of interesting where Tim Kelly, uh, he's coming from a stint with the Texans where they were like uh, top 10 in passer over expectation for a couple years. I think that he was there with Bill O'Brien and Deshaun Watson, Tim Kelly, the new Titans offensive coordinator. So I don't think they're going to be top 10 in passer over expectation, but they should pass the ball more than I think they were like 30th in passer over expectation last year. So it's tough to say what this offense looks like, right? New offensive coordinator. They also have Tannehill and they have Derrick Henry, who both seem like they're on the trade block right now. So it's like you truly have no clue what this offense is going to look like. But we talked about this earlier. I'm a draft capital over landing spot guy. This landing spot is absolutely garbage. But at the end of the day, this is a wide receiver who gets drafted second round, produced in the SEC, 21-year-old early declare, lands your lines wide receiver one, which like I don't agree with. But and I know that he doesn't I know that he doesn't grade his wide receivers for the same stuff that we're looking for, like fantasy points. He's talking about like real life uh utilization stuff, real life helping you win football games. But at the end of the day, he is the guy who had he had Debo, he had uh, DK Metcalf, and he had AJ Brown over Nikhil Harry over Marquise Brown when the community uh, felt it was the other way around. He has always been someone that sticks his neck out, and when he sticks his neck out, uh, when he sticks his neck out like this, I listen. Again, that doesn't mean I'm going to move Jalen Hyatt up to like wide receiver one or anything, but the fact that that Lance likes him is something that is a nice positive indicator for him. The issue is that there's some like very there's very puzzling red flags with him, uh, like. I I don't even know how to wrestle with this. Like I this is an insane reception perception profile. He is 6 foot 176 pounds despite being a guy who only succeeds really at the nine route and like the flat and the screen which is 
really, really tough. He is an 88.7% career slot percentage guy. So a guy who runs like deep crossers and a guy who's like a vertical wide receiver. And like that's if you watch like Jalen Hyatt highlights, it's just him beating the defense deep. That's not even like if you look here, route percentage, he wasn't even running those deep routes a lot of the time. Like he was running a post only 8.1% of the time, a nine route, like what's that? 16% of the time. It's really weird. Regardless though, you look at his success by route, literally he's only good on the nine route and like on the flat, which like doesn't really even count as a route. So it's really weird, man. It is a really weird profile. There are a lot of red flags here, but the speed is there. He looks like Will Fuller. Again, the story with these wide receivers is that he's never going to be a like wide receiver one point twenty point per game type guy, but he's a decent profile to bet on. Now, next we have Zach Charbonnet. And I'm completely fine moving up Zach Charbonnet here if you want to, but just hear me out for a second. Again, I, I don't mind Zach Charbonnet. I actually like Zach Charbonnet. Six foot, 214 pounds, over 60 receptions in his final two years at UCLA. That's all you got to tell me. I'm sold. Big running back to catch passes. The issue is, is that in my mind, he's been a lock to go second round. In this mock, he goes third round, which isn't like terrible. Uh, but he goes third round to the Cowboys. And that's just like tough where he shares a backfield with Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard's probably the 1A. Charbonnet's probably the 1B. He doesn't get to be a futured pass catcher, right? Tony Pollard probably gets a lot of those reps. Doesn't really even get to show off the pass catching upside. And when you go third round instead of round two, it takes you out of that like DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, uh, J.K. Dobbins area of like dynasty startup value growth after one year of being okay to third round running back, change of pace and a good offense and kind of looks like I mean, what we're seeing with like Rashad White and James Cook, right? Like fringe RB2 in Dynasty is probably where Charbonnet would end up after one year for the Cowboys. Now, of course, there's outs to this bet, right? They could use him as a one-for-one one carbon copy of Zeke, where if, we, if you look at last year on passing downs, a lot of the time Zeke was actually the passing down guy and pass blocking. They don't love Pollard pass blocking. Uh, they would use him more as like a change of pace guy. I think last year that changed a little bit where Pollard was more of the featured like third down, two-minute drill type guy. So it really depends. Years past, they, they've used Zeke in that role and Pollard more change of pace. I'd assume with the franchise tag, they would use Pollard in the futured role and Charbonnet in more of a change of pace spot. But it gets tough, right? Where, like, there's not a clear path here. You have Tony Pollard directly in front of you. There's not a clear path for value growth and not a clear path to score points outside of, like, a Pollard injury, right? So it's not as pretty. If he was a second round pick, if Charbonnet goes second round to the Dolphins instead of Gibbs here, then I put Charbonnet probably like 109. Could even make, the, I think I probably put him 109. Maybe 109, 110 is where I put him. But he goes third round to the Cowboys, and it's tough to put him much higher than this. Now, next up, we have somebody that I think you could honestly make the case to, to put in this tier of wide receivers too. Someone that has really been growing on me has been Marvin Mims. Marvin Mims, man. He is, I think, one of the more underrated wide receivers or just underrated rookies in this class. Like, I have him at the 202 here. And if you look at, like, mocks right now, he's more of, like, a third-round rookie pick, Marvin Mims. And he's somebody that is really, really screaming up the board for me. And this mock is kind of, like, the best-case scenario for him, where he goes from projected third-rounder. Right now, I have him projected as a third-rounder. He goes from a third-rounder to a second-rounder, which is huge for wide receivers. And then on top of a draft capital boost, he gets an amazing landing spot with the Eagles. Now, I know you guys think like the Eagles, like they don't pass a ton. They passed a decent bit last year. They were 10th in passer over expectation. They were top 10 in football outsiders passing efficiency. And I keep echoing this. This is not a range of wide receivers where you're going to find a 20 point per game guy, you know, wide receiver, top five wide receiver in dynasty. But like Marvin Mims is kind of perfect. He gets to come in as the wide receiver three behind Devonta Smith and AJ Brown. It's a very wide open depth chart after those two. And, you know, you get him in a spot where he can be really efficient in a role with the Eagles where Devonta Smith is breaking out in his own right. You know, AJ Brown's getting like double coverage. He's getting all the all the resources allocated towards him. You have to also worry about Devonta Smith. And you get little old Marvin Mims taking on like what? Like probably the third or fourth best cornerback every play. And He's going to break loose, make plays, look amazing. He's very versatile as well, where he played under 35% in the slot in years one and three. 
Uh, year two, he played 75.5% of his routes in the slot. So he can play in the slot, he can play on the outside. Whatever the Eagles need for him, he can play. He has a really solid profile where he was an early declare, 21-year-old, uh, produced in year one, was like a really big Debbie guy, had a down year two, bounced back in year three, four three burners, early declare. There's a lot to like about him. Uh, he is also uh, like Zay Flowers in that he's a little bit bigger than those like small uh, Josh Downs, Jordan Addison types at like 170 pounds. Marvin Mims is 5'10", 183, so that's not terrible. And I also, for funsies, uh, did a nice little, like sort of wanted to see what his rookie comps look like uh, the other day because I did my top five wide receiver video. I didn't have Marvin Mims in there. I just sort of wanted to mess around and see what the models spit out. And it's a really fun range where he looks kind of like Brandon Cooks, right? As is like a super, that's like his ceiling, of course. Uh, his more, you know, like mid-range comps are KJ Hamler and Deshaun Jackson. Hamler didn't work out. Deshaun Jackson was amazing. Uh, Dimey Brown, of course, didn't work out. So it's like a wide range here, but there's a lot to like with this profile, right? It's 183 pounds, 4-3 burners, early declare. is pretty much a lot to go day two. We go second round here to a really nice spot. So again, of course... The 20 plus point per game upside, it's not there. There's no really, there's no wide receivers that have that after Quentin Johnson and JSN to me. But I think he's a fine wide receiver prospect that can kind of, you know, challenge for like top 24 dynasty value. And that's kind of what you're looking looking at in the second round uh, in this rookie draft. I, I will say, I think in this class, I think the beginning of the first is really strong. I think the back end of the first, like the early second, is a spot that I probably want to get out of. And like the mid-second mid on, I think is really nice. You can just throw darts at whatever the hell you want. Uh, after that, we have our 203 here. And this is where I go Michael Mayer. Uh, tight end premium, of course. You can make the case to have Michael Mayer a little bit higher. I just don't really love this spot. He goes first round to the Saints. Super crowded tight end room. Or maybe not super crowded, but Jawan Johnson's there. Uh, Adam Troutman's there, who's a guy that they drafted on day two a few years back. Taysom Hill mixes in at tight end or whatever. But of course, you know, first round draft capital means that he should be pretty much treated as tight end one. And it's why I have him ahead of uh, the rest of these, uh, you know, tight ends like Dalton Kincaid and Darnell Washington. He's the only one that goes first round in this mock draft. So I'm fine giving him that respect. Now, even if he doesn't have to battle Jawan Johnson, you get him in a rough offense. I didn't really love what I saw from like Dennis Allen's offense last year. You have Chris Olave, Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara, uh, Rashid Shahid is even pretty good in the passing game. There's a lot of mouths to feed in this offense, which I hate that saying, but it's kind of true here. Uh, it's not a super sexy spot. I guess Derek Carr is a capable quarterback, but it's just tough to get excited about. And he has this profile where he profiles as a TJ Hawkinson. He profiles as a uh, Friar Muth, like he's somewhere on the Friar Muth TJ Hawkinson scale, which means that they don't, he doesn't really have a massive ceiling. When I chart these tight ends, I'm charting, of course, because top 12 tight end season doesn't mean anything. So I chart for actual point per game. I chart for 12 plus points per game, 14 plus points per game, 17 plus points per game. Everybody loves TJ Hawkinson. He's like, you know, the, the unanimous tight end four in Dynasty. All he has to show for is two 12 plus point per game seasons. He has yet to hit 14 plus points per game. He's yet to hit 17 plus points per game, which are, I think, like top three and top six numbers. Uh, historically in terms of like average points per game so he hasn't given you a big ceiling he hasn't given you a huge like the I like tight ends in terms of like I talked about in the stream yesterday but I like the uh, Mark Andrew types the Travis Kelsey those two guys last year were the only two guys giving you difference making points at tight end like of course Lamar Jackson went down that screwed over Mark Andrews but through like 10 weeks they were both giving you 15 plus points per game giving you a massive massive edge I don't know that a guy like Michael Meyer has a path to that right this is his res next to tj hawkinson tj hawkinson is more agile he's more explosive they're both guys who are like 6'4 250 pounds running a 4'7 so the straight line speed isn't there michael mayer also wasn't one of these guys with a high a dot in college he was like 11.7 .7 career yards per reception so it's not like he was mark andrews where mark andrews isn't super athletic but his a dot is great his a dot in the nfl is one of the highest uh, among tight ends he's out there you know catching passes usually Average of the target for him is usually like 14 yards downfield to like 13 yards downfield. Some crazy stuff. And college is the same way. Uh, Michael Mayer is not that same guy. He's more of a possession guy. Maybe he can be a Zach Ertz where he gets you like 90 plus receptions and, you know, gets a 17 plus points per game that way. That's 100% in his range of outcomes, but it's much tougher. Uh, that's more compiling than it is being an efficient producer. So he's not someone I love, but again, I have him here. He's my tight end one in this class. I, I, I really don't know what else I can say. He's a gold tight end prospect. 
And the issue for me there is there's five tight ends uh, using the draft capital from this. By the way, I, I literally inputted all of the draft capital from this mock draft into my model to just sort of see, you know, who comes out as gold, who comes out as elite, everything like that. There's five gold tight ends here. I'd rather take the cheapest one than pay up on Michael Mayer, who to me is just kind of like not a high ceiling tight end bet anyways. Uh, next up, we have Devin A. Chain, 204. He goes third round, 100 second overall to the 49ers. And I'd honestly even be open to moving him up from here. Like, I think you could honestly make, like, you could make the case to have him over Charbonnet if you want. You can make the case to have him in the late first. And I'm sure that if this happens, people would go head over heels. Like, people love when the, the 49ers running backs uh, get drafted. Like, I think Trey Sermon was the late first when he got drafted. Uh, we've seen this in recent years, right? We've seen Joe Williams. We've seen uh, Trey Sermon. We've seen Ty Davis Price. These guys that Kyle Shanahan takes day two and then kicks to the curb instantly. But I cannot think of a better spot for Devin A. Chain than the 49ers like this never even really clicked for me but it's such a perfect spot this is a guy who is 5'8 188 pounds and I think he gets typecasted in the space as like a receiving back that's not really his game he can catch passes but he's not a uh, Tariq Cohen Ito Smith uh James White or whatever he is a guy who is good between the tackles this is a really cool chart I think Arjun uh over at PFF and it shows yards per carry on perfectly blocked runs as the x-axis and the y-axis I believe is uh, yards per carry non on non perfectly blocked runs. So it gets you, you know, how good are you within structure? How good are you without, uh, you know, when chaos hits and what is your yards per carry there? And if you just kind of like, like imagine diagonal lines, so you have like Ty J Spears and Dwayne McBride up at the top. And then like your next tier of pure runners would be like Kendra Miller, Keaton Mitchell, Devin, a chain, Zach Evans, B. John Robinson. That's really strong. Like, as a 188-pound guy in the SEC, the fact that he is giving you a good yards per carry on perfectly blocked runs, giving you a good perfect, uh, good yards per carry on non-perfectly blocked runs, he is a really promising rusher. He was third in the SEC in rushing yards with 1,100 uh, rushing yards this year. He had the fourth-best rushing grade in the SEC this year as well. He is somebody who isn't going to challenge to lead the league in rushing, but he's also not a guy who is a strictly like satellite back, can't run between the tackles. I actually think uh, guys who watch film and are a little bit more uh, in tune with that stuff than me, like I think Noah Hills is one of the proponents of Devin A. Chain can run between the tackles, be efficient, be good at that. And when we look at the Shanahan archetype and you put him in this 49ers offense, Raheem Mostert, more explosive, did the agility drill, so his RES comes out a lot higher. But when we look at them side by side, one of these guys is 5'8", 188 pounds. One of them is 5'10", 195 pounds. It's really not too far off. And they both run in the four threes. This like outside zone type scheme they run with the 49ers, I think that he would be the perfect like Raheem Mostert type guy in that offense. Now, the issue for him would be that it's a steep depth chart decline. You have McCaffrey up top, of course, and you have Elijah Mitchell after that. So he would be RB3 at best in the depth chart competing with Ty Davis Price. So without having a clear path to touches right away, it's tough to put him much higher than this. Uh, but day two draft capital for Devin A. Chain on the 49ers is a really exciting pairing in my eyes. Next up, we have Tank Bigsby at my 205. He goes 88th overall to the Jaguars in Jordan Reed's mock. And this is kind of the story with this tier of running backs where none of these guys would have like a clear path to touches early on, which kind of sucks, but they get good draft capital, right? Third round draft capital is fine for running backs. And Tank Bigsby, he'd be clearly behind Travis Etienne. He'd also have to sort of compete with Jernis Johnson and Jermichael Hasty, who are no slouches either. Like, I know that those aren't big names, but those are, like, good NFL running backs or good replacement-level NFL running backs, right? So he'd have to beat those guys out. But I assume that if he gets third-round draft capital, he'll get a chance to play his way into touches, into a role. Last year in 17 games, Etienne only had five. <coughs> oh, my God. Etienne only had five games with over 15 carries. He only had 43 targets. They're looking for, I'd imagine they're looking for a little pass catching, they're looking for a little change of pace guy. I think Tang Bigsby could carve out a role here. He feels like Akers where he was the only bright spot on just an absolutely terrible Auburn team, but he still led the SEC in yards of the contact per attempt at 4.16 this past year, which is really, really nice. He was third in rush grade in the SEC. He was third in elusive rating. He was one of six ru SEC running backs with 40 plus targets. The only other three that are like big names in this draft class, I believe were uh, in terms of like the SEC was Kenny McIntosh, uh, Devin A. Chain, and Jameer Gibbs. So 
40 plus targets in the SEC is pretty solid. He has a three down skill set, 5'11, 210 pounds. There's a lot to like there. Again, it just sucks that he's behind Travis Etienne. After that, we have Ty J Spears, who if you want to put Ty J Spears at the head of at the uh, head of this tier, and if you even want to put him ahead of Zach Charbonnet, like the 201-ish area, I wouldn't really fault you. Because Ty J Spears, third round to Washington, is a really fun landing spot for him. Because it's not I don't know why I screwed that up, but it's not a it's not a super crowded room. I mean, it's crowded, but it's not crowded with like over the top quality, right? You have Brian Robinson, who of course he was battling a leg wound, so or a bullet wound. So, I mean, if you want to throw that year out, you can, but he wasn't efficient on the ground whatsoever. And the coaching staff clearly hates Antonio Gibson and hates him even more so if they're taking another running back on day two after doing it last year here. Uh, but Ty J Spears is really tough to wrestle with as a pure prospect. My model doesn't like him, but like I'm fine kind of disregarding that because he is a weird prospect. Now, again, the model doesn't like him. He doesn't hit he doesn't hit any of my yearly thresholds across the board until year four. So he doesn't produce until year four, late breakout, senior non-early declare. Uh, he played at Tulane in a small conference. I guess like a fine RES at 7.46, but nothing great. Doesn't have a great speed score with a 4.5 at 201 pounds. So he doesn't hit any receiving thresholds either. So like across the board, it's just like, I don't know, man. It's It's... Really not great, but I get the love. I know that there are some Ty J Spears lovers out there, and I completely get it. I, I I do completely get it, and it's why you know I have my 206 here. Okay, so I'm going against the model. I'm saying you know what, uh, I'll go out on a limb here. I'll put him at 206 because I I get it. Now this is a chart that Arjun also put out, uh, and even if we look at the other chart where uh with the perfect running stuff, like he's up there, you know, him and Dwayne McBride are up there. Now of course he's in a in the American conference or whatever. So, I mean, those numbers are a little bit inflated, but he's still one of the best pure rushers in the class for sure by looking at this that chart. And then you look here, and across the board, this is a guy who has a 91st percentile burst score. And across the board, he is in the 99.5th percentile in yards after contact per attempt. He's in the 90th plus percentile in missed tackles force per attempt. He's in the 96th percentile for explosive percent, which I would imagine just like rushes over 10 yards or over 15 yards. And then... He is in the 90th percentile for yards per out run. That's a nice little promising thing in terms of his receiving upside that his yards per out run is so good. Uh, he also had 25 or more targets in each of his last two years. So that's solid. Uh, again, it's tough because he's playing at two lanes. So it's like, you know, the competition really isn't that stiff. Uh, I do think that Tulane this year was like had like a brief stint in the top 25 for a little bit. I think they were a decent team this year. Uh, but yeah, he's a really polarizing profile. I'm willing to kind of disregard some of the red flags here. Uh, these advanced numbers from Arjun are really cool. He is for sure extremely explosive and one of the best pure runners in this class. The drawbacks are strength of schedule. Uh, I think he also had an ACL injury his second year at Tulane. Uh, pass catching upside isn't amazing for a back who's only 201 pounds. We'd like more pass catching upside than he has. Uh, so, you know, it's really tough. Uh, he goes to Washington who we talked about a little bit briefly there, but maybe he could sort of carve out an Isaiah Pacheco type role with the enemy there. Would it, it would make sense. It's like between the tackle rusher, he's explosive. He's somebody I don't want to bet too, too hard against because he looks like somebody, uh, that could be really exciting after that. I would call this a little bit of a tear breaker. Actually, I wouldn't, I think that this whole second round is like kind of in the same tier, uh, here at the 207, I am going to take a quarterback. I am going to go Hendon Hooker, who goes 55th overall to the Detroit Lions. And this is kind of a dream scenario for Hendon Hooker. He is 25 years old, coming off an ACL tear, doesn't have to start right away, can sit behind Jared Goff, who clearly isn't the long-term answer for Detroit. Just take a look at his contract. They're likely going to get out of it after this year. And this is one of the more promising organizations right now, right? You have Dan Campbell, you have Ben Johnson, you have some stability with the head coach and the offensive coordinator. They're adding weapons, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams. Uh, I feel like I'm not mentioning it either, but I, I want to say in this mock, the Lions added uh, somebody like on day three or something. I could be wildly, wildly wrong and wasting time. Yeah, they just take what? Davis Allen, tight end, uh, Jaden Hazelwood. Yeah, dude, there is nothing that the Lions added here. I thought maybe they did. Uh, but they 1,000% added absolutely nothing to the passing game. But still, Amon Ross St. Brown is great. Jamison Williams is great. They're bringing Marvin Jones or whatever. I uh, would have liked to see them like pick a tight end better than Davis Allen in this mock. But it comes to a great spot, great offensive line with Penny Sewell, and I think like Ragnow is there, and I think Taylor Decker is there. It's a really, really strong 
offensive line, just a perfect spot for him to come where he doesn't have to start right away. And this is a guy who, in a lot of my comps and everything, looks, I mean, I'm not going to say like carbon copy, uh, but he does look a lot like these quarterbacks that are, you know, like silvers or they don't go in the first round that pop off, right? You know, like your Geno Smith, your Colin Kaepernick, your Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson. He is a very good, uh, he's a sneaky good passer where he had 17 big time throws to five turnover worthy plays, which is a great number this past year. He has a career 80 career passing touchdowns to 12 interceptions, which is an elite number. Uh, he didn't test due to injury. He comes in with 10.5 inch hands, which is huge. That's bigger than like Josh Allen and Justin Herbert. So he has that kind of like physical. Uh, he's a big boy. He didn't get the test because of the ACL, of course, but he does look like someone that would be athletic. He had 566 rushing yards this past year, five touchdowns in the SEC. Before that, he had two 700 plus rushing yard seasons. So he's somebody that's going to be very good for fantasy. 25 years old is a little bit of a red flag, but it's literally not an input in my model age. We saw Joe Burrow come in as like a 23, 24-year-old. We saw the same thing with Cam Newton. Uh, Andrew Lick was a senior. Uh, Justin Herbert was a senior coming in. Josh Allen was a senior coming in. Uh, early declare age, all of that isn't a factor for me at all with quarterbacks. 25 years old is really pushing it to the extreme. But at the 207, I'm willing to make the the gamble on a guy like Kendon Hooker who you know, might honestly be able to like – outlast Will Levis's dynasty value like in two years Hendon Hooker might be worth more than Will Levis and that wouldn't shock me uh in the slightest at all now after that we have just a ton of tight ends here at the end of this mock uh we'll go just for or I don't know why I'm acting like I didn't already plan these out but I have Darnell Washington going here at the 208 Darnell Washington he goes uh in this mock 45th overall in the second round to the Packers if any of these guys went first round, I would probably put them ahead of Hendon Hooker and maybe more towards Michael Mayer, but because none of them went first round, Darnell Washington, if he went first round, I think I would put him, uh, you know, right next to Michael Mayer, but because he goes second round, we'll leave him here, uh, and he goes to a kind of a decent spot. Now, they're not going to have Aaron Rodgers. They'll have Jordan Love, which isn't great, but wide open tight end room, like all they have there is like Robert Tanyan, uh, who isn't good. Uh, Mercedes Lewis is a free agent at this point. I guess you have like Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs as like the receivers in this offense. It's really not a lot. Uh, and we talk about like late second and tight end premium. I have no problem swinging on Darnell Washington, especially with like the alternative being the like round three wide receivers of like A.T. Perry and Tyler Scott and Rashi Rice. I'd rather bet on Darnell Washington here. This is a unicorn. 6'7", 264 pounds, runs a 4.64. Probably going to go first round. He goes second round tier. Uh, but he doesn't have a ton of production to go with it right he blocked a ton at Georgia he played next to the best tight end prospect since Kyle Pitts and Brock Bowers last year so they didn't really need him to to catch the ball a lot they didn't really need him to be a featured wide receiver in this offense they needed him to run the block uh or run block a ton which people don't love and I get it right we need our wide receivers we need our tight ends to run routes for fantasy to be dominant but there is something to be said that being an elite run blocker gets you on the field Rob Gronkowski was an elite run blocker uh, George Kittle is an elite run blocker, and both of those guys have produced elite fantasy points uh, in the NFL. So if Jordan Washington is good as a receiver, he'll be used in that way. And I think that he has a lot of promise in that department. He made plays at the combine with like that one-hand grab. He made plays at the pro day. He has very natural hands, and he's a huge, huge big play receiver, which is really, really rare when you consider his size. When we look at tight ends career guards perception which is a a, a stat that I, i've been incorporating recently because i think it, it it separates the mike Osekis of the world where mike Osekis killed the combine went to the nfl and wasn't this like big play tight end at all like we want translatable athleticism we want guys who are athletic and then it shows up on the field with big plays explosiveness efficiency and that's what we get with darnell washington 17.2 career guards perception in the sec is absolutely insane right it puts him above gronk who had 16 andrews had a 15.8 kittle 15.4 Puts him way clear of everyone else in the in the class too, with like Musgrave at thirteen point five, Kincaid at thirteen point two, Mayer eleven point seven, Laporte eleven point seven. And if we break it down into yards at the catch, for a guy who is six seven, two hundred sixty four pounds, man, he led uh, the Power Five tight ends in this class in yards at the catch perception at seven point two, or tied seven point two, while also having a ten point eight yard a dot. Now you can say, okay, but he is, you know getting yak against dbs well yeah he's getting yak against dbs but if you give a tight end something in the flat it's you know so difficult to or i'm trying to what i'm trying to say is is yards of the catch 
is amazing any way you split any way you cut it if a guy we want a guy who operates downfield at that size because he can just bully all the dbs like gronk like remember i, I used to remember of course the pass to play the jets every year like we put Revis out there sometimes on him and it wouldn't be enough. And he'd stiff arm our safety in our corner and he'd run like 30 yards into the end zone. Like that's what we want. We want guys who are going downfield, catching the ball, and then just making a mockery of your secondary because he's too damn big. Like that is, I'm not going to call it the meta, but like that is amazing, right? That is the profile that we want. Uh, so him having a crazy yak, uh, despite the ADOT, like, and of course, you could have good ADOT or a good yak on low ADOT too, like Laporta here at 7.1 ADOT, where you can kind of get like scheme touches where it's like a screen. You get blockers out in front of you and you can kind of like tack on like 12 yards of the catch pretty easily sometimes there. So, you know, give and take or whatever, but I think it's impressive. The The two ways that you get efficiency at tight end in the NFL is really high ADOT. That's your Mark Andrews and your Greg Dolchich, two guys who aren't freak athletes. And you have... Uh, you know, your George Kittles of the world who are freak athletes giving you crazy yards after the catch type production. And when you have a guy in Darnell Washington who's doing both, that gives you a ton of upside. So if he can develop as a receiver, be featured as a wide receiver or featured as a tight end, be featured in the red zone with his big frame, there is a lot to like here with Darnell Washington. Now, after that, we have Luke Musgrave here. He goes second overall or goes second round, 54th overall to the Chargers. And if you want to put uh, Laporta ahead of him, you can. I flip back and forth on these guys every single day. Musgrave is just more of the tight end archetype that I like. Uh, he's bigger, right? He's not. Uh, Laporta is like 6'3". Luke Musgrave is kind of a carbon copy of Travis Kelsey here, where he is 6'5", 253 pounds, runs a 4'6", explosive, fine agility. Just a really, really exciting profile uh, on Luke Musgrave here. And he goes... 54th overall to the Chargers. He's a freak athlete, 9.77 RAS. And he goes to a really fun offense where they're going to have Bijan in this, like, I guess, like Spider Verse or whatever you want to call it. He then becomes the tight end here with Justin Herbert, with Kellen Moore calling plays, who's future Dalton Schultz each of the last two years. You have him in a pretty easy tight end room to work his way up in. Uh, of course, you have like Mike Williams and Keenan Allen on the outside. This is going to be a high scoring offense, a high flying offense. And he gets to be a featured weapon within that as a big, physical, athletic tight end. Sign me right up. Now, Chargers is a great landing spot. So is the Bengals, which is where Sam Laporta goes, who's going to be our 210 here. And he gets the same thing. He is going to be attached to an elite quarterback where he will have uh, Joe Burrow instead of Justin Herbert. He will have a wide open tight end room. He will be able to, you know, sort of gain efficiency from uh, T. Higgins and Jamar Chase on the perimeter and just have a really nice role in this offense. Now, he's more of a move tight end than like a, a true, you know, big boy like uh, Luke Musgrave. He's 6'3". Uh, he's a freak athlete. I do have a little bit of those Mike Gusecki concerns uh, when it comes to Samuel Porta, right? He's at 11.7 career yards perception despite being an absolute freak athlete. Like I think that he ran a, a sub 4'6 at like 245 pounds. That's really crazy. But I'm willing to give him a little bit of a benefit of the doubt here because maybe Iowa just sucks, right? Maybe Iowa, their offense isn't making big plays anyway, so it's hard to have a high yards perception on a bad offense. I'm completely open to that idea. And something that I think also quiets those concerns is the yards of the catch here. When we look at his yak, 6.3 yards per uh, yards of the catch per reception, 7.1 A dot, over a two yards per out run. Those are all solid numbers. So I'm open to the idea that he's not Mike Gusecki and that he was just in a bad offense uh, on a low A dot. That's completely, completely in his range of outcomes. So it's a red flag. It's a slight red flag. He goes to a great spot. Going to be the third or fourth option right away in an awesome passing attack next to Joe Burrow. If you want to have him ahead of Luke Musgrave here, uh, I wouldn't fault you. If you want to have him ahead of Darnell Washington, you can also do that. I know some people really, really like Sam Laporta. I'm open to him being good. Now, after that, you can make the case for Dalton Kincaid here if you want. For me, if he goes outside of the first round, he becomes a silver tight end prospect. Now, that doesn't really move him so far down. Like I probably have him in the early third here, but I'll pass on him now because I'd sort of rather, you know, take all the gold tight ends here. And then I'd rather take a swing on two day three running backs who are in good spots and are the only day three running backs who would still retain a silver grade, which is huge. Remember, Ty J Spears, Bigsby, Devin H. Chain, Charbonnet, second and third round guys all silver tier RS grade uh, running back prospects. We have two guys who go day three and are still silver tier. So that's really exciting. They both go to good spots and I'd rather take a swing 
on these day three running backs. Now, the first one we have is Sean Tucker at my 211. Sean Tucker in this mock. Should I pull up the, the day three? Sean Tucker in this mock. I'm going to shrink. I know that you probably can't even read that at that point, but I'll just have it here just in case if anybody wants to zoom in or whatever. But Sean Tucker goes 163rd overall in the fifth round to the Bengals. Now, that's not great draft capital, but from the research I've done, fifth round really isn't different from fourth round. So I know that fourth round is like almost like bunched in with third. It's really fourth and fifth round. It's just like kind of like day three plus is what I would call it. Uh, Fifth round, fifth round draft level isn't great. But you have a guy in Sean Tucker who kind of looks like Aaron Jones at 5'9", 207 pounds, caught passes, 21-year-old early declare. He broke out in year one. He produced all three years. Career, 64 receptions, 622 receiving yards, four receiving touchdowns over his three seasons. Great athlete. Even if you don't trust his like self-reported pro day, we knew that he ran track in high school and was really, really fast. He is a good athlete. He catches passes. Everything we could possibly want besides the draft capital. But he goes to a Bengals team that has an ambiguous backfield with a top 10 offense, Joe Burrow running plays, and that's what we want, right? We have Joe Mixon, who we don't even know if he's going to play. We don't know if they're going to cut him, if they're going to move on from him. Uh, he has like that weird like legal stuff that's up in the air. He could get suspended. We really don't know. And then Samaje Piran is gone. He's on Denver now. So it's a wide open running back room. It would be beautiful for Sean Tucker, they're always adding to their line. I think last year, what, they signed Leo Collins. I think this year they signed another tackle. They're adding to that offensive line. They're looking, you know, I mean, they're not looking to have a featured, featured run game, but if they draft Sean Tucker here, I think they would use him. And then we also have Israel Abinaconda. Israel Abinaconda. I don't know why I struggled so hard on that. Uh, he goes fifth round, 167th overall to the Rams, and it's pretty much the same story here, where he goes to a backfield of Cam Akers, Kyron Williams, and Ronnie Rivers. Ronnie Rivers is someone that you can just throw out that name. Kyron Williams is no more than a, like, slow uh, passing game specialist, and Cam Akers has been inconsistent since the uh, Achilles injury, where he was, like, the... I mean, Darrell Henderson just came out as, like, the, the clear RB1 on, like, remember, like, the first Thursday night game last year, and then after that, uh, Darrell Henderson was the featured guy for the first four weeks, then it was Cam Akers, and then Cam Akers, like... Remember, Cam Akers like, took time away from the team for a week. We thought he was going to get traded. Uh, of course, he rips off like the last three games is amazing, but he's been up and down, inconsistent, doesn't have the most juice after that Achilles injury. And he immediately brings in Sean McVay, brings in Izzy Abinaconda, who just is going to bring all of the juice, right? 4 3 9 40. Of course, he's a pro day time. So, I mean, if you want to adjust him, fine, but still, he looks really explosive. 4 3 9 40, 41 inch vertical. Uh, similar size and speed to like Kenneth Walker, like 5'10", 216 instead of 5'9", 211 or whatever. But I like that comp as someone that has a lot of juice, a lot of explosion, a lot of speed, and was a pure runner in college. They both have very similar profiles, Walker and Abinaconda. They both didn't do much in year one and two, and then year three absolutely exploded. Now, the issue with Abinaconda, I got to find an easier way to say this guy's name, is that he had just 12 catches in his final year. He's not a big pass catcher, but I will say there is some hope. Unlike Kenneth Walker, who was a complete zero over his entire career, uh, Abinaconda had 12 receptions in his final year, but the year before that, he didn't even have 1,000 rushing yards, but he had 24 receptions. So this is somebody that was featured more as a pass catcher before his true breakout. So there's definitely some upside there for him as a pass catcher. And even not, he can just be a really strong between the tackles runner who has really explosive plays and can give you, you know, like a Josh Jacobs-esque like 40 to 50 receptions. I think that's kind of what we're seeing with his upside here. And he's someone that I love the upside of. Super athletic, super explosive, super young too. Just 21, just 20 year old early declare. Uh, so it's easy to see McVay who... Uh, usually likes to have like a featured running back in his offense who doesn't catch a ton of passes anyways. Uh, use Abinaconda in that way as the, you know, RB1, take all the touches, doesn't need, you know, 80 plus receptions or whatever, and can kind of just give a nice, you know, baseline of RB play for the Rams. Maybe they kind of turn things around a little bit next year. Now, woo! Hour 20 of me going through my top 24 rookies, man. I love it though. I love doing these videos for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know I haven't been, you know, like posting every day and putting out serious, serious volume uh, of videos. I've kind of, kind of been picking my spots. I want to pick it up a little bit here because it's draft month, but I also want to make sure I'm delivering you guys really, really good videos. I think like I put a ton of research into that video. That was 12 pages of notes, me going through all of them. I hope you guys enjoyed this. 
Uh, I, actually, I do want to show the board one more time just so you guys can see uh, the first two rounds or whatever if you guys kind of want to soak that in or whatever. Um, but I will say, after all of that, that's essentially what I'm going to do when the draft happens. I think the draft will happen end of uh, April, and then literally that Sunday I'm going to sit down, uh, input all the draft capital on the RS grades, and then I'll make the RS grades live for everybody on Patreon, and I'll make uh, an updated rookie rankings by the end of that night for everyone on Patreon. So if you want access to that, the RS grades, uh, I just did a dynasty rankings update. So if you have a startup coming up or you just want to make trades and stuff, I have my top 300 or top 290 Superflex Titan premium rankings on there on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. I have my uh, like buys and sells in the positional tier. So you can kind of go through and see, you know, what, what would Ron do here? Who would he trade all of this? There's a lot to be gained there. Patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. I give everything that I got to that platform. Everybody that's on there absolutely loves the services I provide. So if you want to make sure you check that out, I'll have a link down below in the description, down below in the comments, all of that. Patreon.com slash Ron Stewart will take you directly there. Uh, I love you guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. I know it ran a little bit long, but I've been told in the past, you guys kind of like the long videos. So I hope you guys do enjoy this. Uh, as always, I will see y'all in the next one. I got the juice. I got the juice. Channel, chat on zone. Foolies glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rapper song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Meaner.